Ho, ho, ho. On this episode of Mythbusters. I caught in these monkeys just in this morning. Tis the season to bust holiday myths. It's alive! As Jamie and Adam overflow <laughs> with goodwill. <laughs> Attempting to make a merry Coke and Mentos Rube Goldberg machine. Arise, my son. And Carrie Grant and Tori break it down <laughs> to find out how to keep your tree evergreen. I like to style the tree. I give it a little bit more fullness right around, you know, here. Cook a festive roast on a radar. <laughs> that is so funny looking. Should we all be wearing our lead aprons? And find out if falling frozen turkeys can be terminal. Who are the Mythbusters? Adam Savage. Ow, 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 ow. And Jamie Heineman. It's almost too exciting. Between them, more than 30 years of special effects experience. Cue dramatic music. Joining them, Carrie Byron. That's gonna be so cool. Grant Imahara. Listen to that baby purr. And Tori Bellici. Paramedics are nowhere to be found. They don't just tell the myths. They put them to the test. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho yourself. It's Christmas and we have to do something about it. It's not really my bag. What are you gonna be doing on Christmas morning? I'll be in the shop like always. See, if you're already gonna be there, let's shoot a Christmas special. Okay. Excellent. Christmas myths, here we go. Whether you think the Yuletide season is the most magical time of the year or a bunch of bah humbug, it's full of fables Jamie and Adam can't wait to unwrap for you. What do you say we do something special for the fans? That sounds like a great idea. What do you have in mind? I'm thinking like a Rube Goldberg Christmas contraption. I love the idea, but where's the myth? We don't need a myth. We can just have some fun. It's Christmas. We can make this big machine that's got uh, Mentos and soda going off. It's a Christmas theme, all sorts of mechanical stuff, explosions, you name it, we'll throw it in. I love it. Let's do it. Great. What the heck is it? A Rube Goldberg machine is a series of elaborate mechanical things. Like a domino effect, each activates the next to a very simple conclusion, like peeling a banana. The EP Birds made a version recently using that gushy marvel of Diet Coke and Mentos. And their popular internet creation is about to get a whole new Mythbusters makeover. The guys have made Rube Goldberg machines before for big budget commercials. And they've learned the most important element of all is a plan. So the plan starts off like this. You've got a Mentos candy that's rolling down a ramp. It falls into a soda bottle. That erupts. It knocks a paddle wheel, which... Let's move it along. We don't want to spoil the surprise. The float comes up and turns the Christmas tree lights on. And that's how it's all going to work. Phew. Now, to add to the holiday season rush, Mythbusters deadlines are way tighter than Hollywood's. The biggest constraint for this is time. We've got to make this thing basically a hundred foot long device with about, you know, 50 or 60 moving parts. And we've only got a couple of days to do it. To power their invention, Adam and Jamie are using the volatile combination of Mentos and soda. <laughs> In a recent myth, the guys blew the lid off this global phenomenon. <laughs> they discovered the active ingredients in the Mentos and Diet Coke, combined with the effect of nucleation created from the pitted surface of the candy itself, cause a rapid release of carbon dioxide and a Krakatoa of cola. Jamie gets to work on the starter motor for the whole rig, an inverted metal and mesh cone that has soda bottles welded to the rim. This sweet baby doesn't run on gas. What we do is take a, just a, any chunk of steel will do, like this nut, perch that on the inside of the neck of the bottle. We put our Mentos on it, and then when we yank the magnet away, we get 
that. Time for a test run. And three, two, one. <laughs> Jamie, it's excellent. Sort of. <laughs> well, I'll get the mop. Quickly. It's going for my steel rack. For his next trick, Jamie attaches a float control valve to a bottle of soda. There we go. I found that dropping the Mentos into the soda, if you release the pressure slowly, you can get just gas. That's cool. The gas inflates <laughs> Jamie's plastic party favor very nicely. Adam, come here. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Some more holiday joy arrives, special delivery. There you go. Oh, they're hideous. Oh. So uh, what's the symbolism here? The monkeys are the last part of the sequence that is all kind of on one plane. When they applaud, they'll gradually work their way forward on a little kind of seesaw thing that'll trip, and then that sets off the next series of gags. Tip that scale, monkeys! Bye. Goodbye, my little friend. And you too. The guys still have a long way to go. <laughs> Time to quit monkeying about. Come on down to Jamie's Monkey Warehouse. We got the monkeys all day long. You know, Christmas just isn't complete without Christmas trees. But as the holidays go on, they start dropping their needles and they make a huge mess. I've heard of all sorts of mythical recipes for keeping needles on your trees. Well, let's get a bunch of trees and test all the methods we can find. It's fun to choose your own Christmas tree. Jerry likes the spruce tree. Jane likes the tall pine with long needles. Nothing evokes the feeling of the holidays like the smell of fresh pine on a real tree. But sometimes, all the debris they drop makes you wish you'd gone with plastic. To put to the test mythical miracles touted to keep your tree fresh, Grant and Tori head off to go Christmas tree shopping, while Carrie stays back to make needle catchers. Basically, it's going to be a little platform with a ridge so the needles don't blow away, and a little hole where we can sweep all the needles into a little clear plastic container, and we can measure the volume of them by day or by week, depending on how long it takes for all the needles to fall. She staples six by six pieces of thin plywood to wooden base frames. Okay, one down, nine to go. As she continues building, the guys arrive at the Christmas tree farm. But as they drive through the gate, they run into a little problem. Tori and Grant are used to being stopped at the door, but that's usually when they're trying to get into a fancy restaurant. It's not exactly a great first impression. Yeah, just go down to the tree farm and get us some trees. Luckily, John, the owner, is an easygoing guy. John, nice to meet you. I'm Tori. Grant, nice to meet you. Sorry about the sign. No problem. No problem. heard it. John's preferred method of keeping his trees moist is plain and simple. Uh, we put them in water. Water? Yeah. Anything you put in there is apt to impair this uh, physiology of this tremendous suction developed by the capillary action. Water is the best you can use. So what does he think about other people's crazy concoctions? Well, I think people will go for the, their thing that they like best. They empathize with this tree, of course, and they want to feed it something they like. Grant and Tori pick out 10 Douglas firs, all the same size. Okay, definitely, definitely not mm -hmm. that one. No. When I was a kid, we couldn't afford ornaments. Their trees selected and measured, they cut them down and load them into the truck. Before they leave, they have to do one more thing, put John's sign back up. Not again. Sorry. Did that sound good? That's that didn't good. sound good. It's not exactly a great last impression either. Really, I'm fixing it. John, here's some gratis airtime to say sorry. 
It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas as the team painstakingly pieces together a holiday-themed Rube Goldberg machine. Jamie and I are building a kind of mechanical Christmas pageant machine. We're trying to make it something that's both filmable and interesting and involves all these different things. Mentos and cola, Christmas, mechanical stuff. It's alive! Let's go indoor bowling with Jamie. Strike! For this setup, Jamie builds a mini bowling lane then suspends a bowling ball from a tightly wound cord. Ready? Wait, uh, okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, knock them down. Next, he makes a device that will power his ball. He pours a splash of Diet Coke into a dish and inserts copper wire that's connected to a small motor. The cola acts as a conductor. This little electric motor is right out of a microwave oven, I think, probably one of the ones that we've used and destroyed on the show before. It's not getting much power, but it's enough to make it turn, and that's enough for us to pull a little pin out and make the bowling ball drop. Adam's cooking up another trick. He welds an oven to a specially designed steel stand that will serve up an unforgettable holiday meal. So it'll be perched like this. Hammer will hit it. All right, there's a couple of kinks. Just a couple. But if they iron them all out, it's going to be a great show. We've got liquid squirting all over the place. We've got chemical reactions. We've got, you know, wheels spinning. We've got balls rolling. We've got things going off, cannons exploding, electrical arcs jumping. Arise, my son. And Buster in a pear tree. Oh, it's awesome. It's like a ballet. So, step right up, folks. The spectacle is about to begin. Back over at M7, the team is prepping their Christmas trees for the Great Needle Drop Fest. So I've taken the advice of the expert. He said to cut an inch above our original cut. This is going to open up the cells and allow whatever we put into our trays to be absorbed into the tree. The trees are inserted through the holes in Carrie's needle catchers and secured to their stands. All righty. Then Grant vacuums up any debris. We just want to make sure that when we do officially start the experiment, that we start everything with a clean slate. All the needles we collect from then on will be the ones that we're judging our experiment. One tree will be kept as the control and fed only water. Seven others will be treated with a different anti-needle dropping remedy, from the ordinary to the out there. First is a plant-friendly additive, fertilizer. That's nice. Tori adds a ratio of 5% to a gallon of water and pours it into the stand. All right, time to kill a Christmas tree. Tree number two isn't so lucky. It gets to suck up a 5% mix of bleach. Bleach contains the toxin chlorine that kills bacteria, so maybe it'll keep it sparkly. My prediction is this thing is gonna be brown tomorrow. Next is a libation that's a whole lot more refreshing. Lemon, lime, and soda. I'm guessing that why you would use this versus, say, regular water would have to be either sugar, carbonation, or preservatives, because otherwise it is just water. Now. People seem to think sugar, maybe because it makes them hyper, will perk up the tree. Then Carrie crushes up and dispenses a popular pain reliever that some people believe stops the headache of cleaning up fallen needles. There we go. Next is a little blue pill that's a <laughs> mystery product. I'll let Carrie set it straight. I'm trying to dance around how to say this because people might have their kids watching. Um, um, Santa's little helper. Daddy's little helper, uh, maybe mama's little helper. Santa's little helper contains nitric oxide. In humans, it increases blood flow, so it might help plants feel more vigorous, too. It's gotta take a little time to take effect. I don't know, does it? Another possible trick of holding things firm is to use hairspray. So I am applying hairspray 
as a needle retention device. And what I think is going to happen is uh, I spray this all over the tree and it creates a little barrier that will keep the moisture in and keep the needles on. You know, I like to uh, style the tree. I give it a little bit more fullness right around, you know, here. Put the hairspray. Very nice. Very nice. The final tree is the ultimate Mythbusters special that takes the hairspray idea to a whole new stratosphere. The team suits up and breaks it down old school style. Bring it in. Ain't it funky? Funky. Like a happy hazmat team, they spray the tree all over with a clear coat of urethane. The idea is that we're going to completely encase the tree in a thin, clear layer of urethane. And that's going to keep all the moisture in. It's the ultimate extra super hold spray that also adds fabulous shine. So what do you think, uh, average American family, think they're going to be able to do this? Oh, totally. I have a spray roof in my house. Yeah. The trees will be monitored over a six-week period, and their needle-dropping results will be revealed at the end of the show. Okay, Christmas is coming. It's time to think about getting the bird. Well, unlike my bean curd substitute turkey, there's all sorts of stories and myths about the dangers of the frozen turkey. I've heard it's cracked floor tiles, like broken toes, and even caused the death of some pets. Well, why don't we separate fact from fiction and see how lethal these frozen turkeys are? Yeah, it'll be like a public service. Exactly. Every holiday season, we humans cause the turkey population to plummet. But is it possible for a falling frozen turkey to turn the tables on us? When dropping turkeys, what do you need? Well, first up, a steel turkey dropper rig to play the role of a frazzled homemaker. Grant is making its power mechanism. I am rigging up the air system for the turkey drop rig. And these are rotary pneumatic air cylinders. When I hit this button, it's going to open up the arms just like that, dropping the turkey. Meanwhile, Tori demonstrates his handyman skills. So we need some hands to hold the turkey for the turkey drop mechanism. So what I'm doing right now, I'm gonna pour up some hands in some urethane and I'm gonna put this tube, these steel tubes into the hands and they will slip into the arms of the rig. He pours the instant urethane into pre-made molds, gives them a shake and presto. Give him a hand, everyone. Little fella. Don't touch me with those. Well, you don't know where these have been? Yeah. Tori attaches his arms to the rig. Put it there. Using a sandbag as a substitute bird, they're ready to test its turkey dropping technique. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> Three, two, one. Oh, what Sorry. the heck? Well, looks like we need to make some new hands. Now, that's what I call a firm handshake. Do we want to talk about why I just got hit in the head with a thumb? Um, um no. no. While the guys make their modifications, Carrie is creating some feet. Adam already has made a mold for our steel cap boot experiment in the past, and I'm going to use this because it makes a great skeleton foot. The skeleton is made from a mix of urethane and fiberglass that dries to a realistic bone-like texture. Oh, that's a good mold Adam made here. This one fits into here. This one. Then they're encased in a foot-shaped mold of ballistics gelatin. Nice. Her feet are definitely suffering from fallen arches, but they'll do just fine. OK, just go stick these in the fridge till we use them. Now, because we're all dog lovers here at Mythbusters, to test the turkeys falling on small pets myth, Carrie is making fake pooches. She covers canine replica skeletons in ballistics medium. This is definitely not a breed recommended for families with small children. This is not a normal family Christmas for me because dogs in my family are very cute and snuggly. They're, they're neither drippy nor frightening. 
to up the realism, professional still life model Gertrude is helping out. I'm trying to figure out exactly how the hindquarters look on a dog. And uh, Gertrude's modeling for me because she's almost the same dog. Maybe not quite the same. She adds some bulging eyeballs. Yeah, um, this really doesn't have anything to do with the myth, but um, it's a flesh-eating zombie dog, um, so it, it needs some flesh-eating zombie googly eyes. <laughs> so I started out making a dog. I love it. Nice doggy. Grant, you might want to sleep with one eye open tonight. Oh, you should take a puppy. Mwah. Carrie, you don't want to get too attached. Over at M5, it's going to be a gas. Jamie and Adam are finally ready to activate their Rube Goldberg machine, a 100-foot-long holiday miracle with 60 moving parts. Just to make the point, I wouldn't even walk fast near a lot of the stuff, so nobody breathe on this one, all right? I can see you're really getting into the zen of this thing. I'm thinking about it with everything I see these days. Well, it's time to do it. We're all done. It's the moment of truth. Let's go do it. Okay. It's the moment of truth, but how's it all going to work? Pay close attention because here's exactly what's going to happen. At the top of this cone are 10 bottles of cola. At a prescribed moment, Jamie will yank on this string, releasing a mentor into each of those 10 bottles, which will then spray cola down into this funnel, down into this tube, up to this pair of wires, which will make an electrical contact, which will release this motor, sending this bowling ball spinning, 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 spinning down. It'll stop, but the bowling ball will keep on spinning, release itself from the screw, fall down, hit all 10 Santa bowling pins, which will yank on the string, send the skiers down. The skiers going down will yank on this magnet, which will release this soda bottle, sending the party favor going going like this, boom, releasing this mento, all the way down into the basket, releasing this mento, all the way down into this basket. This ball will go down here, tunk, tunk, Dunk, release the train, woo woo, all the way around, all the way around into the present, boom, the present closes, releases a mento into this bottle of soda, sending this robot, pushing the candle under the string, the candle will burn through the string, the string will release the hammer, hammer will hit the stove, the stove, which has roast in it, will release its roast onto this seesaw, onto the dinosaur platform, jiggling this thing, releasing the uh, two little doodads here, which will send this seesaw going this way, releasing a ball into this robot, turning him on. This robot will find his way eventually to this hand, which will boom, Turn this switch on, sending the Jacob's ladder like Frankenstein's monster. That will set off this fuse. Boom! Setting the cannon off. The cannon will release the pirate hat. The pirate hat will turn on the monkeys. The monkeys will go down the ramp, releasing the nut from this nutcracker's mouth, which I just did. Releasing another mento into this bottle of soda, sending this thing spinning, pulling a string out, which lets this foot kick the broken crutch here, sending Buster crashing into the ground. And that's what's going to happen. Happen or not, you've just witnessed the longest piece to camera in Mythbusters history. This is Rube Goldberg, run one. In three, two, one. Jamie pulls the wires. The soda bubbles up, but the machine comes to a stop. Something oh, needs flushing. Come on. There's something blocking it. <laughs> That's the problem. The end was above the level. They reposition the tube, mop up, and are ready to go again. Go back, run two. Three, two, one. <laughs> this time, the soda passes through the pipe with ease. There she blows, uh-oh. Triggering Jamie's spinning bowling ball mechanism. <laughs> oh, it's very smooth. That hits the set of pins, oh. but the skiers are stuck on the slope. Here we go again. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the nature of it, of the, uh, of the beast. Reset. With all this pent-up tension, Adam needs a release. The main constraints we're working with is there's no cheating here. Each mechanical gag leads to the next one inexorably. So if something messes up, we have to reset everything and start from scratch again. Let's leave them alone to figure out what went wrong this time. This is all your rig, isn't it? Yeah, you got something you want to say about it? Just wait and see. 
Can a falling frozen turkey do this kind of damage? To find out, the team are about to test the pummel power of frozen fowls with their mechanical homemaker. See we're about right? Pulling the turkey out of the freezer? Yeah. Somewhere around there? You've got to imagine like you're pulling a turkey out of the freezer, so the normal height is around 60 to 69 inches. A force plate is put in the drop zone. And that's going to tell us how much energy the dropping turkey is going to impart on your foot. So how many people is mom catering for? An 18 and 3 quarter pound turkey. This would probably feed, I don't know, a family of four, two if they're really hungry. It's time to stop talking turkey and drop them. Yes. No. Yep, good. In three, two, one. Wow. Okay. Right in the middle. Woo! The bird dived like a boulder, but how hard did it hit? So you can see here the initial hit is 1,901 newtons. And that is? 427.3 pounds. Wow. Dude, that could break your foot. Let's find out, shall we? The plate is removed, and Carrie puts her foot down. This is very, very dangerous. This time, they position the turkey pointing down. It might do more damage. Three, two, one. Oh, that was a perfect shot. You can feel that. Ouch. Call your podiatrist pronto. The pointed turkey pounded the foot with more than 770 pounds of bone-crunching force. Oh, oh. <laughs> Brutal. That broke the middle of the foot. That's horrible. That threw the mm. thickest bone right here. That was pretty thick. That's a strong part. That was a great shot. The reduced surface area of the pointed turkey applies more concentrated force to the foot and therefore ups the ouch factor. With a smackdown that strong, you definitely wouldn't be doing this for a while. Now we're going to move on to the next step in our myth, which is small pets. And I've made this ballistics gel zombie dog to illustrate our point. Zombie dog is under foot of the cook, prime falling scraps position. Does anybody else feel kind of bad about this? It's kind of cute. It's not a real dog. I know, but I'm getting attached. Three, two, one. Did you hear that sound? Did you hear that crap? Poor little fella. A giant frozen turkey was not the treat he was hoping for. The gang checks the high speed, and it's not pretty. That is messed up! He's still smiling. Didn't break his spirit. Legs look like they broke, back caved. OK, let's, let's move on to the next one, because yeah. I think it's going to be worse. In the name of due diligence, they put another gel pet in the danger zone. In three, two, one. Oh! This reminds me of my Christmas. Oh! This drop is a real eye-opener. Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh, my God! Oh, oh my the God. head snaps around. <laughs> His little legs eye. snap <laughs> off, the <laughs> eye comes out. I'm sort of like half stoked, half creeped out. I'm all creeped out. Our zombie dogs need urgent medical attention, so the team takes them to a veterinarian <laughs> to see exactly what kind of injuries they sustain. I dropped a turkey on my pet dog. And then we I deep fried it. <laughs> yeah. I can tell. You're just like a regular vet, and so you're probably not used to zombie dogs. No, I'm not used to zombie dogs at all. But we'll 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 see. We'll take a look. Mind if I hold him? Yeah. Oh. oh, he's cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there, you there you are, little man. The models are measured and x-rayed just like real dogs would be. Some of the other patients are not amused. Dr. Moran delivers his prognosis. Afraid it's not good news. 
aside from the multiple spinal fractures, which uh, the dog has, has a poor chance of recovering from, the right rear limb is shattered, the left rear limb has multiple fractures, and there's gonna be a lot of surgery, and even with that, he may not come through it. I know this is a fake dog, but you're sort of depressing me right now. Yeah, the prognosis for this dog is not, is not great. So, is a falling, frozen turkey dangerous to your pet? Plausible? Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, because these aren't real dogs, we're not going to be able to test this for real, so it would have to be plausible. Yeah. It's a little sad, isn't it? It is a little sad. Even though they're not gonna, real? I'm going to feel real bad about these guys. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> you, you seem real broken up. <laughs> okay. Broken up, that's a good word to use. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. Back at the workshop, the team tends their Christmas tree garden. It's two weeks into the test, and each tree is being regularly treated with its chosen method and checked for needle droppage. What I'm doing right now is I'm sweeping up the needles into Carrie's needle catchers, and this way we'll be able to accurately measure which tree is losing more needles. I have to control my breathing, because if I breathe too hard, I might knock off more needles. Carrie and Grant inspect the trees for both needle retention and aesthetics. Last week's pick was soda. Hairspray was my pick. He's doing good. Santa's little helper's doing pretty good. Color's not so good. Okay, if you were gonna just judge on color, the control is the greenest. Yeah, the one that we haven't added anything to is looking really good. The reasons for the results may be the soda is adding sugar that gives the tree a boost, and the hairspray is helping keep moisture locked in by gluing the pores of the leaves shut. Surprisingly, the one that's performing the worst is fertilizer. It looks like the tree equivalent of pattern baldness, something gone horribly, horribly wrong. And how about the Mythbusters' ultimate urethane sprayed tree? I would say the worst would definitely be our super painted Mythbuster tree. That's turning a really weird red. There are four more weeks to go in this battle of the pines, and with no front runner, it's still any tree's race. Remember, short breaths. For some holiday fun, Jamie and Adam are putting a merry Mythbusters twist on the EP Bird Soda and Mentos latest internet spectacle. There's something blocking it. Now, if they could just get it to work. Oh. Go, Bird Run 3. It's take three, and this time Jamie's engine is off to a smooth start. Boat is turning, and it's spinning. We're good. Oh, that's good. That's looking happy. Strike. Oh, yes. Come on, baby. Come on. Will Jamie's party favor reach the peak? Totally do it. You can totally do it. You're up for this. You're trained for this. Yay! <laughs> A nice performance under pressure. The Mento slides down the ramp. And Adam's trick shot is nothing but net. The ball boards the train, comes to the end of the line, and triggers their soda swinger. Come on, come on, there we go. Come on, baby. That's it. Red Robot Man marches into position. Go, robot. The turkey roll is perfection. But yellow robot man shorts out. Why is he stuck? He's never gotten stuck before in his life. Adam is discovering this time of year can be very stressful. Jamie and I have both done rigs like this for commercials before. And when we've done gags like this, I mean, we've had between two and eight weeks to build all the gags, and then like between three and four days to shoot the whole thing. This rig, 37 gags, we had one week to build it and shoot it. How about some holiday music to lift everyone's spirits? 
Goldberg run for? Oh, the string. Run five, fingers crossed. Take six, go back, run. There it goes. Yep. Oh. Oh. Oh, no. The things that have never gone wrong are the things that are going wrong. Goldberg, run seven. Someone's goodwill is fading fast. All the ones that seem totally bulletproof are the ones that are now giving us trouble. In fact, everything that I thought we didn't have to worry about at all are the things that are going wrong with it. Goldberg, take eight. Tis the season to be jolly, but Adam's about to throw in the towel. All this talk about Christmas is making me hungry. Funny you should say that, because we actually found a myth that involves cooking a turkey. Apparently, there's enough radiation coming off of a radio antenna to cook a turkey, just like in your microwave at home. You have got to be kidding. No, I'm serious. What sad person cooks their Christmas dinner in the microwave? Everyone's sad at the holidays. <laughs> Every happy homemaker has their preferred method to truss, stuff, and roast a holiday turkey. But for this recipe, you don't even need an oven. A microwave heats food by emitting electromagnetic radiation that travels through it in waves. The waves vibrate water molecules that raise the temperature. Radio and TV towers also send out this kind of energy, so maybe they can also bake a bird. To put the tower theory to the test, the team takes a scenic drive to the tallest broadcasting antenna in San Francisco, Sutro Tower. At 977 feet, it's going to be a long climb to bake their bird, but the view should be spectacular. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm Tori. Hi, Tori. Turkey and industrial tape in hand, the team meets general manager Gene Zastro. So, Gene, what we want to find out is whether microwave energy can cook a turkey. So what do you think of us jumping up there and taping a turkey to it, just to check? <laughs> I don't think that's possible. <laughs> no, permission is denied. And Gene can't be sweet-talked. But what if I said pretty please with sugar on top? No with sugar on top. No, 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 no. No, it really is too dangerous to go up there with the antennas active. Hey guys, maybe the warning sign strung up all over the site should have been a clue. So does Gene think the TV tower cooking method would have even worked? Microwave transmitters that the stations use are very low power. They're in the neighborhood of a, a couple of watts, as opposed to a microwave oven, which is, you know, seven, eight hundred, even up to 1200 watts of power. Plus it's very confined. Looks like this myth may be plucked. So now what? I think we might have to resort to another plan. OK. Another plan? Now that's a plan. How about a broadcast news van? You going to let us try to cook a turkey on top of your van? Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> that's how I warm up my coffee. ENG vans use microwave signals to send images on location back to the studio. Video journalist Yoli shows Tori how the beam is sent out. It gets bounced off of here. So the beam is actually being shot, shot out, out of here. Out of here. And then and it sends it out. Uh -huh. Okay. Tori puts a bird fresh from the refrigerator on its mark. All right. And checks its temperature. We're looking at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the dish is raised to the sky, and it's time to go live. We're gonna let it roast for an hour, right? One hour. Okay, just tell me when. Okay, three, two, one. Turkey doesn't have much to say. He may not have the right personality for television. This should work. Yeah. It's in the right frequency range, and it's about the right power. Okay. It's just the beam's so tiny, it may only be heating a small So it's just gonna cook a little section? Yeah. 
After an hour of airtime, it's time to see how much he heated up. All right, one hour has gone up to 60 degrees. His temperature rose 20 degrees, but that was only from standing in the hot sun. Maybe we just need something bigger. Yeah, that's possible. So it's all aboard the SS Jeremiah O'Brien, a World War II cargo ship to unleash the big guns. Hi. Welcome aboard. I'm Pat Maloney. Carrie. How Hi. you doing? I'm Tori. Tori. Nice Welcome to meet aboard. you. Steady. Yeah. Steady on that. I don't have my sea legs yet. <laughs> yeah. Captain Maloney is letting our Mythbuster landlubbers try to fry on the ship's radar. Radars are another device that emit electromagnetic radiation. So have you ever heard the myth that you can cook your turkey on the radar of your ship? I haven't heard about cooking turkeys. There's risk of sterilization. Putting his fertility fears aside, Tori secures the bird to the antenna so it doesn't fly off. That should hold. Good, because I got vertigo watching you be up there. Before they begin, they take the turkey's temperature. Down to 50 degrees. So what we've got is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the FDA says that you need at least 180 degrees Fahrenheit for it to be safe to eat. So that's our target. Let's go. Clear the decks. It's time to beam up. I need warp speed in five minutes, so we're all dead. I can do it. I can do it, Captain. Captain Maloney fires up the radar. OK. We're transmitting. And our turkey soars like an eagle. Whoa, that's kind of faster than I thought. <laughs> that thing's getting pretty fast. That okay. is so funny looking. Should we all be wearing our lead aprons? It looks bird-brained, but the waves passing through the turkey might be powerful enough to cook its goose. Yeah. I think that steel plate in my head's starting to warm up. Our radar spit roast is attracting a lot of attention. I sure hope that's not the Coast Guard. And the sea air is making Tori feel like king of the world. Remember that scene in Titanic? You know, like sitting on the ship, looking out at sea. With a turkey? I don't think there was a turkey in that movie. The turkey's been spinning for an hour. Plenty of time for our camera person to get all artistic and for our bird to get nice and toasty. I'm ready for a hot turkey sandwich. So how hot did it get on the inside? Oh, this looking ripe. Ripe as in cook or ripe as in? Ripe as in nasty. What do we got? Are you kidding me? What is it? The temperature went down. <laughs> <laughs> Only on Mythbusters. It's 45 degrees. The turkey is colder than it was before it went up. Maybe you hit a giblet. There you go. <laughs> 47 degrees. The wind chill is actually making this turkey cooler. A radar and broadcast dish are bigger than a microwave, but they don't put out the right wavelengths to burn a bird. Also, there's no confined space to keep the energy in. This one's definitely busted. Yeah, I would expect that after an hour of exposure to the radar that we would get at least a little increase on the inside. We're not getting anything. I think it's busted. It's actually working better as a refrigeration system than actually cooking the turkey. Great busted cutter down. Hey. The myth's done, but not the turkey. Nice catch. For a little fun and to release some frustration, Tori has prepared a bird with his own recipe we cannot reveal. This is Mythbusters, and we haven't had an explosion. So I've mixed up a little special stuffing, and hopefully, with this turkey, we'll get some results. It wouldn't be Christmas without an explosion. He places it in the microwave. They seal it up to lock in all its goodness. There you go. Ah, run. And the whole team waits in hungry anticipation. Stand behind I don't know what's going to happen. In no time at all, the turkey is done. <laughs> Finally. Dinner is served, Mythbusters style. How about a second helping? <laughs> Merry Christmas, you guys. That uh, is the most disgusting turkey I've ever seen. <laughs> Let's eat.
it's been a sweeping six-week challenge to find the best mythical remedy to keep your Christmas tree looking lovely for longer. The fallout has been carefully collated and counted, and it's time to reveal the winner. It's been six weeks since we started this needle drop experiment. I have to say, I think these results are really surprising. Definitely. I mean, it's obvious that the fertilizer is probably the worst remedy to keeping needles on a tree. Yeah, I would have never have guessed that. And it was only a 5% mixture to the water, but it lost four times as many needles as the control. I mean, there's a bucket filled with needles. We couldn't even get them all in our tube. More interesting to me is the fact that every other treatment that we tried did better than just water alone in the control. And you know what else is surprising is the uh, bleach and the Santa's Little Helper, they lost the least amount of needles. Yeah, but I think this myth should also be about aesthetics as well. And while the bleach kept a lot of needles on the tree, it turned it a really funny color. Santa's Little Helper, same thing, retained the most amount of needles, but it looked really, really sickly in the end. All right, well, we need to find a winner. So we're going to have to find a balance between the needles that fall off and the way the tree looks like after the six weeks is up. OK, well, that winner is definitely hairspray. It kept a lot of needles on the tree, and at the end of the six weeks, it still looked really nice. All right, so we're going to be using hairspray from here on in. Maybe you will. I think there might be a fire hazard involved with using hairspray on a dry Christmas tree. That's Just a, me. And that's a problem? <laughs> <laughs> Around you, yeah. All Jamie and Adam want for Christmas is for their soda and Mentos powered Rube Goldberg machine to work all the way through just once. Why is he stuck? He's never gotten stuck before in his life. Until now, there's been little joy. But this is the season for miracles. Nice one. There it goes. <laughs> We're good. Oh, that's good. That's looking happy. There goes the steers. There it goes. It's going. It's going. It's going. Come on, baby. Yes. Mentos going. Mentos going. Oh, it's very smooth. Come on. Find your home. Your home is there. That's it. Oh, yes! Get ready for the bang! The monkeys are going! <laughs> going fast. Come on! Here's hoping you like your gift and have a holly jolly holiday season. 